Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Elevate IT TOLA Technology Summit 2. Uh, we are here with Scott Howitt, the CIO for McAfee. Uh, he will be our keynote speaker today and will be uh, uh, speaking with us about um, digital transformation and transformation of the digital leader, but also about uh, if your technical C suite is too crowded. Uh, Scott, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it on over to you. Um, I know the folks here would rather hear from you than me. So um, I will uh, put the ball in your court, sir. Okay. Thanks, Casey. I appreciate it. So, um, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about today is a little bit of the transformation of the digital leader. And, and I know, you know, I think blockchain is probably the most, uh, the only other most overused technical term that we're hearing today. So you hear a lot about transformation and digital transformation, but I, I think there's really a leadership transformation that needs to be going on now. And so I think the, the best way to examine, um, you know, where we're going is a little bit to look back at where we came from. And so, you know, I've, I've been fortunate in my career that I started off in IT. So, uh, you know, I was a developer for six or seven years at, at Ross Perot's old company, EDS. And then I became the, the chief technology over at jobs.com. And it was just when the internet was taking off, right? And, and so a lot of new technology, putting that together. And then I became the chief information and benefit, chief information officer at Benefit Mall, which was a company that was all about digital insurance and bringing that online. And so as, as I got into that role, I was still a pretty young leader and I figured out, wow, I, I don't know a whole lot about security. So I moved into the information security space and, and I took some progressive roles. I was at Alliance State as the director there. And then I moved on to be uh, the, the CISO at, at JCPenney at the time. It was a pretty thriving retail chain and had about 1,088 stores. And then from there, I went on to MGM Resorts International out in Vegas, 29 resorts around the world. Um, you know, 14 of the largest hotels in the world are, are part of their chain. And then, you know, after spending five years in Vegas and you can only spend so many years in Vegas, I decided to come back home to Dallas and, and be the CIO at McAfee. And so I've seen it from both sides of the table. And I think that's where it becomes interesting because as you, as you wear both those hats, you see a lot of the tension and the dynamics between the two roles. And I, and I think that's one of the things that is, is executives and leaders, we, we got to think about that dynamic a little bit differently and, and maybe change it, especially as we're moving into an age where things are moving so rapidly. And so, you know, let's, let's take a look at the history of the CIO, right? So the very first time that the term CIO was coined was in 1981 in a book by Sennett and Grubber, which was, you know, information resource management, right? Strategies for the 80s. And to put it in context, uh, my dad worked at IBM, and so we got one of these beautiful things on the screen here. It was an IBM 5150. Um, if you're really lucky, you could put the two meg hard drive in it. Um, and, and so the role at the time, it wasn't really thought of in an executive role, right? There were the application programming team maybe even resided uh, within the actual business space, right? Not a lot of budget responsibility went along with this role. And it really took the CIO quite a few years to elevate to the level of the other C-suite offers, right? And, and, and so, you know, it's been squarely in the C-suite for a while but I think what you're seeing is there's still an examination of, hey, is technology really delivering more for less in my organization? Is it really bringing value? And, and you know, you, you, you talk to some CIOs at some organizations and their budgets are on the, on the levels of billion dollar budgets, right? In, in some cases it's warranted, but I think that's always gonna be the question for the CIO is, is what technical value and, and how am I bringing down cost or speed to market in the organization? And then if you, if you look at the CISO, a little bit even younger role, right? So it's kind of traced back to Steve Katz, 
to be the first CISO at City in 1994, right? So probably lagging the CIO role by about, you know, 10, 15 years. And, it, and kind of the same thing, the career path started, you were the dude in the corner who knew ACF2 or, or Rack F or Top Secret or whatever. And it was typically buried in the infrastructure, rarely appear to the CIO. And it was a lot of times, you know, seen as just the compliance function or just an access management function. And again, not really viewed as an executive role. And so now we go ahead and, and move to modern day. And if we, if we look at the state of the CIO today, a lot of companies not only have a CIO, but they maybe have a, a digital business officer or a chief data officer or a chief innovation officer. Um, I know we had a chief digital officer at MGM Resorts. And, and I think the reason that you seeing that role erode a little ways is because, and why we're bringing in all these other technical specialists is the organizations often don't perceive that the CIO is moving fast enough and is keeping up with the technology. And, and, and don't get me wrong, it's a hard role because you're often saddled with a lot of legacy technology that's hard to put away. And it doesn't give you a lot of time to think about innovation, right? But I think it is one of the things that back to, if you're sitting in the C-suite with the CFO and the COO and the CEO, COO, um, they're really expecting you to understand the business as well as them and looking for ways to have technology drive it. And so they're really looking for somebody who is gonna come into the organization then and help them change out around and make digital an enabler, right? In more and more, you know, I read a really interesting article about as we go more to cloud, you know, the chief information officers teams more into the chief integration officer, right? You're just tying a bunch of APIs together for SaaS applications or, or things like that. And so, you know, you're seeing a rise of other digital officers within the organization because they're not perceiving some CIOs to be innovative enough. And then if you look at the state of the CISO today, you know, the, the good news is, you know, they've typically elevated, you know, in some organizations, they still report to the CIO, but in other organizations, you're seeing them, uh, you know, elevate to the level of, of peer to the CIO. And, and in my last organization, I reported directly to the CEO where the CIO reported into the COO. And, and you know, there was a regular meeting with the board members all the time. And they wanted to hear about, hey, what's what's new in the world of cybersecurity? And in if you if you look at it next to um, you know global monetary risk, cyber is is number one board concern. Right. And, and so that's the good news is the CISO is getting a lot of that inter interaction. However, I do see a lot of CISOs struggle with the conversations that they have with the board. And, and you know, I think the board, maybe occasionally they want to hear like, oh my gosh, how many times are we attacked a day? But I'm not sure that that's really an interesting conversation. A lot of the conversations that I used to have with, with my board at MGM of revolved around, hey, here's our, you know, if you, if you think about a casino, it's actually six or seven businesses rolled into one, you know, certainly they have the gaming business, but they also have a hotel business. They also have a restaurant business. They have a retail line of business, convention, entertainment. And so we talked a lot about prioritizing the work we did to protect the revenue stream. And we did different work to protect the different revenue streams. And that's a more interesting conversation for the board. And so I think that's where we, we need to, you know, maybe as, as CISOs, we need to be a little bit more thoughtful about the conversations we're having rather than just focusing on the cyber criminals. Yep, they're important to talk about as well, but you know, there, there's a lot of what risk are you actually mitigating, right? And forever, 
the CISO budget has been the one that didn't get touched. And so now, uh, you know, especially in the age of COVID, I think the CISOs are now waking up to the reality of their budget will not be forever growing, right? And in an even bigger challenge as I see it is most, uh, you know, I, I did this at my last organization. I had about 60 people in my security organization and I said, hey, everybody, you know, raise your hand who at some point was a developer. And, and there were absolutely zero in my organization. And it's like the days of, you know, COVID has certainly changed it for us, right? The days of packet capture and firewalls and all that, yes, they're interesting. And on some level, you will always have private networks and, and needs for VPNs and all that. But the tools were, that were set to watch the network are not where it's going. Uh, you know, behavior analytics, watching what's happening in the cloud, watching API to API interactions. That's where it's going to. And, and a lot of the skill set got trained down in the infrastructure level. So they're going to have to go in, in, and learn new concepts, right? And, and so I would say there's a shortage of cloud application and container savvy security people. And, and so that's one of the things that, you know, we're really going to have to go out there and address. And, and so, yeah, well, again, I had a, a very interesting conversation or interview and was on a panel and we were talking about it and we pulled the audience and we said, okay, if you, if you look at the CIO and the CISO, how many of you think that that's a copacetic or, you know, relationship in the organization? And 80% of the audience says it's, it's a very um, broken relationship in most organizations. Right, the CIO feels like the CISO scorekeeping, and the CISO feels like the CIO doesn't understand what's going on. And, and and so, I think one of the things that can really benefit each other is, hey, you know, why don't we start appreciating which other people bring to the table, right? And so, what should the CIO appreciate about the CISO? And it's hey, cybersecurity is the number one board risk and the CISO has the ear of the board. Like I said, every board meeting I was at when I was at my last organization and the CIO, if he got invited once a year, that was a rarity. So if the CIO was having issues and needing help from the board, I could actually go in and help sell the case to the board to him, right? In, in a lot of cases, the CIO um, maybe at one point was technical, but has had a harder time keeping up with all the different change in technology. Or I find that CISOs, they don't have a choice. If they don't keep up with the new technology and start thinking about it and getting ahead of it, they're gonna have a very hard time securing it. And, and so in a lot of cases, the, the CIO can lean on the CISO to bring some deep technical knowledge into, into their world, right? And the CISO has the most visibility into the assets of the organization. So a lot of times the CISO is gonna help the CIO discover assets within their organization and maybe help you find ways to eliminate those assets to free up money to do other things, right? And, and what should the CISO appreciate about the CIO, right? is the CIO for a longer time has had to understand the budgetary and financial challenges of the organization. So likely they're much more versed in OPEX, CAPEX, EBITDA, you know, how the lines of business make their money and all that. So in, in no, you know, if the CISO is gonna create a risk profile for the organization, they have to understand where the money is made, right? And the CIO is likely to have a better understanding of the business priorities. So not only where is the money being made today, but where do we think it's going to be made in the future? And how can I help secure that, right? And, and a lot of times the CIO just through the course of their work is going to have tighter relationships with the business and is going to be perceived as more of a partner. And so again, where the CISO can reach across the aisle and pull some of the CIO's concern into the board, the CIO can pull the CISO over into the business 
and get them to work together, right? And I think this is where, boy, if you're, if you're getting ready to do a transformation or if you're getting ready to do much more innovation, which is the demand nowadays, right? You're going to have to work more in lockstep together, right? And so, and I, I think the other thing that we have probably is some misaligned expectations. And so, um, you know, one of the cool things that I always loved about being in technology is like when laptops first got, came out, like I got them because I was in technology, right? So I had to have a laptop to work from home or when even, even in the green screen days, I had a dial up green screen. Yeah, it was probably working at about 9,600 baud, but you know, I had that uh, when cell phones came out, had that, had pagers, all those things, right? And, and so, but somewhere probably around 2007, when the first iPhone came out, right? That started to swap. And, and so now what you have is in the business, people have newer and better technology in their homes than often place they're getting introduced to them in the business environment. So we, why the, the you know, digital executive thinks they're delivering a great experience to the business, the business is like, you know, why can't you work like my Alexa at home or why can't you work like my Nest at home or, or whatever? And so there's, there's a little bit of misalignment of expectations and we gotta figure out how to state that, right? And, and again, what we feel is modern IT, um, you know, where again, I, my guys get super excited about a lot of data center technology or whatever. And a lot of times it's like the business doesn't care. They're like, push it to the cloud and have a nice day, right? And so, you know, maybe we're not aligning quite with the business and how it works, right? And if IT is not perceived as an enabler, we're going to be moved out of the way. And, and so what I mean by that is I do think that that's why you're seeing the rise of these other digital officers or technical officers because, it, you know, and I've heard it multiple times in multiple organizations is, oh yeah, we're going to bring in that Silicon Valley guy because they worked at a dot com and they understand how to move faster, right? And, and so, and, and I will say that also causes conflicts because a lot of times the digital innovator doesn't understand the dependence on legacy technology. And somehow you got to figure out how to marry that and be seen as an enabler and go faster. And as more and more moves out of your data center into the cloud, tools like CASB can help, right? But controlling the sprawl is going to get more and more difficult. And so you're going to have to start you know, working with your procurement teams and your other officers to make sure that people aren't just popping out their P card and, and going and moving stuff to the cloud, right? And, and so, you know, we are, you know, if I think of my, now I hesitate to say it, but you know, I've been, I've been doing this for about 30 years. And so, you know, I, I've gone from, <clears throat> you know, having a big 40 pound green screen on my desk to, hey, suddenly we're all networked together with PCs to, hey, suddenly we're all connected to the internet to now our smartphones are connected. Now it's to, you know, we don't need data centers anymore. We're moving out to the cloud. And so I think it's a, an interesting parallel. And, and I see, you know, people kind of fighting against that sometimes of, well, you know, they don't understand why we need this technology or whatever. And, and so, you know, one of the great things about working in Vegas is you get a lot of history. So I, I think this is a great history lesson for people. Uh, businesses are always tearing themselves down and reinventing them, or at least the ones that survive. So what COVID has certainly done for us is some business models that were probably already on the decline died quicker. And we, but we also saw with that a lot of innovation that was just coming out move faster. So let's use Las Vegas as an example, right? It, it started as a gaming town in, in the desert. And you used to, you know, I don't know about you, but my parents always loved it, right? Because it was, it was 
cheap food and drinks. You know, a lot of times, the, obviously, the drinks were free, but it used to be the food was free all the time as well. And it was to encourage more people to gamble because people love to come out and, and game. But over the years, what happened is, is the Gen Xers and the millennials and all that started to hit Vegas. They weren't as big of fans, right? Gaming wasn't their thing. And so where you saw it change is the free buffets were replaced with celebrity restaurants. Um, you know, bottle service, it, I, I don't get it, but boy, I see my daughter do it, you know, when she came out to Vegas is people are willing to pay, you know, a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars for bottle service at a table, right? And so what you started to see change is a revenue changed over time. If you look back in the 90s, you know, Vegas was gathering a good 60% of their revenue from gaming and, and by you know 2014 it was down to less than 30 percent right in in you know this is this view is the overall strip but i know at mgm resorts you know gaming was we appreciated the gaming but it was really the venues and the chefs and the entertainment that was bringing in all the money right and so Here's a here's a, a a business that reinvented themselves, and you know I, I think it's one of the 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 best scenes in in Ocean's Eleven. You know the the remake with Brad Pitt where they're standing in front of the Bellagio, and it's like yeah I, I remember when this was the Dunes, and like yeah I remember when this was the Sands, and all that, and, and it's like wow they seemed really big at the time. Right, and now it just reinvented itself and got bigger, and you have these big lavish venues. Oh, and then COVID hit, right? And so now suddenly, what we're doing today, no more live conventions. People are having to do virtual conventions, and, and so you saw that all change. And Vegas really started in a death spiral, and and so how did they react to it? They said, "Hey." You know, you can work from home or you can work from Vegas. And here's what we'll do. You know, you come, we'll have the room set up for you. And the great thing is we'll have high speed internet and we'll have a, a personal assistant, right? And, and one of the other big challenges that you've always had at Vegas, if, if any of you have checked in and long lines and all that is, you know, hey, now it's going to be keyless entry. You don't even have to interact with anybody or whatever. You just come in, you check in on the, you know, Uber over from the airport and you walk right to your room and make it a safer alternative. But you still want to get your money, but the gaming tables weren't open. It was hard to social distance. They couldn't crowd the floors. They couldn't do all those things. And so online gaming and sports betting surged. Right. And so now as a patron, you could come and you could bet from your room. And if you live in one of the 16 states where they have reciprocal gaming laws, you can game from your couch. So the come, you know, you, you think about, you know, the original MGM at the time it was built, it was one property. It was the largest hotel in the world. And then over the next few years, you know, it gobbled up Mirage, it gobbled up uh, the Mandalay Bay Group, became a, a global conglomerate, and they keep on evolving their business. And, you know, I, I think that was one of the greatest lessons I took away from, from working in that environment is if we put a restaurant in the property, it had six months. And if it didn't figure out how to make money in six months, it was ripped out and they brought in a new one. And, and so, you know, businesses that can evolve with the times, that's what they're looking for is how do you help your business, you know, take technology and evolve and go with it. And so I think another really good case study is let's go over to China and, and look back to 2011. You know, Tencent wasn't, it was a big company, but it wasn't the 100 pound gorilla. In, in China, and and so they launched. They had a, a um, 
a online chat function called QQ Instant Messaging. And they said, hey, this, this mobile phone market has really taken off. We're gonna go ahead and cannibalize our own market, which you don't see companies willing to do a lot here. And we're gonna launch WeChat for the smartphone. And we're gonna encourage everybody to, to get off uh, QQ chat in, in QZone, right? And so with, within you know, a couple of years, they had 100 million users and then they had 300 million users, right? And then they started innovating on it where they're like, well, you know, WhatsApp doesn't have voice and video, so why don't we add that in? You know, and, and why don't we start adding some additional functionality in? And even the players that were already out in the field hadn't thought about those innovations yet. So, you know, they, they cannibalized their own market and then, you know, went right in and started taking a huge share of the market away from incumbents, right? And, and I think we think a lot in the U.S. that, you know, like, uh, hey, once Uber's out, like the game's done, right? And, and you know, it, it, there are competitors like Lyft and that coming out and trying to eat up that market. And you see that a lot more in the China market where they're much more aggressive about going after it. And so if you look at where they went to next, they said, well, now we own 300 million users how about we get into digital payments? And so they very cleverly timed their launch with, you know, if you're familiar with Chinese culture during Chinese New Year, you give out red envelopes to friends and family and people who work for you. And it's a, it's a tradition, they're stuck with money, right? And then they said, hey, you know, we're gonna make it super easy. Instead of you having to hand out these red envelopes, just go ahead and open an account with us and you'll do a virtual red envelope and you can send it to your friends over their mobile phone, right? And so the first year it resulted in 60 million transactions and five, new, five million new bank accounts acquired, right? And, and so at the end of 2014, Alipay had owned 82% of the digital payment market where Tencent only opened 10.5. But because of that innovation, and using these QR codes where you can make payments and all that, Alipay has slipped down to 53% of the payments and Tencent owns 39%. But the innovation didn't stop there. So they came out and they made it the Swiss army knife of all applications. So if you, if you look at WeChat, um, you know, not only does it have all the chat functions, but it has tons of wallet functions that come with it in digital payments, right? It has a lot of third-party services, so you can do new subscriptions, you can, you know, it works like Uber where you can do ride hailing, it works like Lime where you can rent a bike, you know, it all works like DoorDash where you can do food delivery. Also allows you to find a doctor, book an appointment, and pick up your prescription all through the application. And it also has all your social functions on it, right? And, and so in, if you look at how the U.S. evolved during COVID, right? What happened for us is now you're seeing in restaurants, oh, I won't hand you a menu. I'll just, you know, stick a QR code and you can see the menu that way. Well, WeChat took it one step further and said, well, why do as a wait person even need to come to your table? You got the QR code, scan the menu, click the button, tell me what you want, and the wait person will bring it out to your table. And so, you know, you skip a, a huge piece of the transaction, right? And it makes restaurants more efficient and they can service people with less staff, right? And so, the U.S., we struggle with that Swiss Army knife concept. So even Facebook, their chat function has broken away from the core app, right? And, and we see it as you have to have a bunch of different apps. And they've approached the market totally different. It says, hey, you know, let's just go ahead and, and we'll do it all through one app, right? And so that's, that's real innovation. So where should we be looking it, innovation as we go into 2020 and beyond, right? Um, 
you know, one of the great things about cloud is, and why you, I don't know about you guys, but my mailbox is inundated with dot AIs, right? And, and the reason you're seeing so much of that innovation is before I couldn't afford to purchase 600, you know, NVIDIA GPUs and start doing some machine learning or AI in my organization. Well, well now with cloud-based AI, you know, AI, I can take, you know, GPUs just when I need them and turn them loose when I'm done with them, right? And, and so it's made this much cheaper. And then, you know, one of the things when I, I, I used to give a, a talk on IoT and where it was really going, and, and I had a lot of, it was a CISO knowledge share group, and I had a lot of PNC CISOs in, in that group that were into insurance. It's like, well, for insurance, you know, it'll never happen. And, and so it's like, okay, yeah, like you don't need to worry about IoT and insurance. And now you're already seeing it, right? Uh, um, you, you have the little modules that you plug into your car and your insurance company sees how you drive and how much you drive and they change the rates accordingly. And, and I think what will happen is that will be the norm of how you're charged insurance. You'll be paid by the drink, not by, you know, it'll be better for you and it'll be better for the insurance company. Their actuary tables will be more accurate. I, I think you'll start seeing it in health insurance. They'll start tracking some of your health data, right? And so, you know, certainly we have privacy laws to protect that, but that's going to be more and more the new norm. And even if, you know, like at the casinos, we were using it to monitor, um, you know, food, food safety, right? It, or the, is a chicken at the right temperature in the, the freezer, right? And so there's, there's a whole lot of that that it's just popping up everywhere that you see. I think you'll see bigger and bigger UI overhauls that make it easy, easier for users to use stuff, right? And, and you know, I, I heard a great talk about, you know, data is a new oil. So, we, you know, we have the ability to track more and more data and we have better and better algorithms and all that to comb the data. And so you got to think about how you're going to handle that. And then AR, you know, especially I think AR even more so than VR, um, you're seeing a lot in the oil fields. Hey, if I'm out at a remote oil field, I can slip on a pair of, of like Google Glass or whatever and I can overlay the instructions of how to fix that oil pump just by looking at the QR code, they'll come up. And I can also audit and record that I service the pump properly. So if there's ever a problem back at that pump, I can just run the tape and see what people did, right? And then SD-WAN and 5, 5G penetration, you know, being able to work at wire speed anywhere is totally going to change the way that we think about, you know, a wired network is no longer um, something that will be desirable. And so that will be a big change for how technology works. And so if you, if you look at why transformations fail, um, you know, it's because in back to, you know, kind of what I've been trying to illustrate all along, Cloud adoption is not a business objective. <laughs> That's a technical objective, right? And so Gartner came out with something called the pace layer approach, and it's actually just the common sense approach to transformation, right? Is if you, if you look at your entire tech stack or your organization, you should have three levels of systems. You should have systems of innovation, Right, and those are, hey, these are the new things that I'm gonna try and maybe fail out and see how they go, but we got we gotta go ahead and give it a tent and see what can make us new and better. You got systems of, of differentiation, which are, are unique processes or competitive advantages, right? And, and then you've got the systems of record, which you don't have to go fast on. And, and so, you know, it was one of the things we, we, you know, we finally pulled PeopleSoft out of our organization and, and went to Workday. And that was, that was the, you know, a lot of the conversation was around, like, who do you think buys our product because we're using PeopleSoft and not Workday? 
right? And so, you know, we fall in love with technologies or we fall in love with processes. But if you're, if you're not asking the question of like, how does this contribute to the success of the business? You're just not asking the right question, right? And, and so it's a great way to think about the, the way you transform your organization and it helps you with the prioritization. And then, you know, the, whoops, let me get that. You know, the business objectives must also drive the effort, right? So again, back to cloud adoption is not a business objective. And what happens a lot of time, right, is you, you know, you'll, you'll have a SI or you'll have a consultant team come in and they'll say, hey, let me tell you all the costs that you're gonna save by going to cloud. And then what ends up happening is <laughs> there's always that double bubble where, oh, I thought I was gonna get it right off the on-prem solution and I didn't. It is harder to get off the on-prem solution, move to cloud than it was. And so now I'm paying this double bubble, right? And I'm not getting the cost optimizations or when I do, it's down the road. And, and likely it's the next CIO or CISO who is going to get the benefit of that savings. And, and so, you know, you have to, to plan for this. And then also, you know, you got to plan that now's the time when we're going to have to retrain and recertify our staff because these technologies are bringing us into a new reality. You know, it is funny because, you know, we're doing a big cloud movement at my organization. You know, McAfee is a, it's a 20 year old company. And, and so, you know, we, we've got some old technology and we got some new technology, right? And so if you, if you look at it, you know, <clears throat> the, the, one of the things is we're getting more cloud people on our staff. They're like, okay, I want to go and get, you know, somebody who has 10 years experience with containers. And it's like, guys, stop. Kubernetes was released in 2015. There is no guy with 10 years experience, right? And so it's got to be almost back to, you know, I harken back to the 80s when technology was really in its heyday of enabling businesses a lot of organizations invested in retooling and retraining your people. And I think you're gonna to have to, right? And I think it's also okay to have conversations with your organization of, hey, we're entering a new space and some things are gonna go wrong. And it'll take us a while to be as proficient as a cloud native organization, but we'll get there. And, and you know, freedom to fail is number one, an expectation you should set. And, and two, it's, it's a way to help your organization prepare for some of the bumpy roads you may encounter. And so, you know, kind of wrapping up some key components for the transformation is, is one is like, get your internal house in order. It, and what I mean by that is if, if you've got a, a whole lot of old technology and all that laying around that you've never really put the effort in to clean up like now's the time because the your naysayers are going to point to these things and you should have a plan for it or you should have it well under control and as your organization is looking for innovation lean into the new technology even if it means going getting some new skill sets or, or partnering with a more nimble group until you can get that muscle memory up in your own organization and focus less on the technology strategy and more on the business strategy. And the way you can do this is, you know, work like a venture capitalist. And, and so it's funny because I, I get this question a lot, like what would you tell a young up and coming executive, you know, in the technology space? And I'm like, man, I kind of wish I would gone and gotten my MBA in finance because you know we spend a lot of money in the organization then understanding how you capitalize things and how you depreciate them and all that is super helpful and it also tell you how your cfo is thinking about it so that you can get on board with them right in in you know the you got to show them the balance sheet and the effort should address the business priorities and in the focus from here on out is going to be speed and flexibility like we've never seen. And, and, and so, you know, I don't, I don't know about you guys, but when COVID hit, um, 
we went from, yeah, we, we, you know, we, let's be cautious. We may close down an office or two to, oh yeah, all the offices are shut and we need to have, you know, total, you know, connectivity for all our employees overnight. Luckily, we had the VPN capacity because we had a lot of people that work remotely or in the field. But what we saw in our supply chain is some of our call center vendors or whatever, they fell over because their VPNs couldn't keep up with it. So they couldn't service our customers. And so we had to look at new innovative technologies like AWS AppStream to kind of virtually VDI the applications and things like that. So what I'd like to do is kind of leave you with three quotes before we, we open up with, uh, you know, the Q and A it's just as things to think about. So one of the misquoted, often misquoted guys in the world, uh, one of my heroes is Gene Krantz. He, he ran all of the, uh, odd numbered Apollo missions, including Apollo 13. So he, he didn't say failure was not an option. He actually said, you know, we've got a lot of options and failure isn't one of them. And, and, and I think, you know, this is one of the things that he said is, is after the Apollo missions, right? Is, you know, to recognize that the greatest error is not to have tried and failed, but in trying, we did not give our best effort. And, and so I, I think that's something that, you know, too often we punish teams for failure. And, and you know, I, I tell my team, this all the time. Hey, if you don't fail every once in a while and you don't take some risk, you know, we'll never innovate. You know, if, if you make the same mistake twice, that's a, t a totally different conversation, right? But mistakes will be made in order to get to the place that you want to go to. And then, you know, I, I think it, on the subject of where are we going, right? We, we can't solve today's problems by using the same kind of thinking we use when we created them. And so, you know, I, I think that is really the case of, you know, we, we can't just throw more hardware at it anymore. We, we got to think about how to optimize, how to innovate, and how to do those things and, and be able to look at it from a fresh lens. And what I would encourage is, you know, create teams of high diversity so you'll get a lot of different points of view looking into your into your organization. And then, you know, the, the last way is, you know, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And and I think that's really the mindset that you gotta go into is is if if you don't have a vision for where you wanna go and you're just trying to keep up with what everybody else is doing, like you're always gonna be reacting. So, you know, figure out your own reality and, and kind of chase after that. And so um, if, you know, I'm sure we'll have some questions here, but if you ever want to reach me at any time, best way is just DM me on Twitter. So that's what I got. I'll turn it over to Casey if there's any questions. Yeah, fantastic, Scott. We, uh, we definitely have a couple questions here. Um, let's start with the first one from Michael. Uh, when a vendor meets with you to educate you on their solution offerings or sell the organization, what resonates with you versus the other C-level personas with regards to technology innovation? Yeah, you know, it's a really good question. I meet, um, I, I'm, I'm not scared of vendors, right? A lot of people are like, I'd never give them a call because I'd never get any work done. I, I do, will typically read through it, and if it's a technology I've never seen before, I want them to come in and show it to me. And, and you know, it, it, because it's a, it's a good way for you to keep yourself fresh, and it's a good way for you to, okay, ask exactly the question you asked. Like, what business value would this, you know, how would I go to tell the CFO that I wanted to purchase this technology? And, and, a, a, if you humor me, a great example I would give is I, I had a good friend of mine. He, he's actually um, the SEVP of our cloud business here back when I was a customer of McAfee, not, you know, a, a, a member. And, and he said, oh, you got to go look at this product. It, it works for business email compromise. And I'm like, whatever, dude, like I've got business email compromise licked. I don't need to look at it. Oh, come on, man. Just take a look at it. Tell me what you think. I'm on the board. Okay, and I, I went and looked at it, and it was the most innovative technology I'd ever seen. It plugged right into the Office 365 API, and it read the sentiment of the emails and looked through the metadata 
And so where a lot of email um, tools are looking at just kind of crowdsource somebody saying, oh, this is a fish, and then it, it, it relies on everybody telling everybody else what's bad. This is like if somebody spearfished my CEO, it would tell through that sentiment. It was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And so, you know, you, you, gotta, you gotta set aside some of your time to look at new technology and, and that might be a key to some of your innovation going forward. Or it might be, you know, a little bit of a waste of your time, but hey, now you know never to, to answer their emails or, or uh, phone calls anymore. <laughs> um, Michael had a follow-up question too. Uh, with the, the move to the cloud becoming more of a reality as the digital transformation has happened uh, or, or forced due to the pandemic, uh, will the trend of budget from the C-suite become more of an OPEX versus CAPEX? Yeah, and you know, it's interesting because some companies, um, you know, I, I came from one of them, the casinos, they, they love gobbling up CapEx and they hate OPEX, right? And so, and you see this with the utilities companies too, because, you know, they're, what they can charge customers is based on EBITDA, right? I, there are ways that, and that's why it's so important back to the, boy, I wish I had gotten a degree in finance too, is for example, a lot of organizations will allow you, if you buy a reserved instance in through your cloud service provider, that's a depreciable asset and you can make it CapEx. Now it's, it's, it's depreciation period may just be one year, but if, if you have CapEx or OpEx challenges, you should, you should work with your, your, number one, your cloud service provider, because I'm sure they've sold it. But two, with your CFO of, what do you want me to spend, OpEx or CapEx? Because I can probably make it either for you, just depending on how we purchase it. And so it's a really important question of, yes, likely you will be spending more OpEx but, you know, if you need to spend CapEx, there's ways to go about that as well. I encourage you to reach out to, you know, your finance team and your, your cloud service provider to help you in that guidance. Very good. Uh, Susan has a question here. In the Swiss Army Knife example with WeChat and how the U.S. sees the market as separate apps, is this driven by our perception in the U.S. of data ownership? Uh, is it our perceived risk to do more within one platform? Um, of course, the data all goes back to the same company to be integrated for profiles, uh, but maybe the separate apps are easier to accept. Yeah, I, you know, that's a good question. I think if you, um, you know, China certainly has a different perception of privacy than a lot of the Western world, right? And so maybe that is how we view it. I, I don't think that was the driver though in, in their market is, you know, if you look at their version of Silicon Valley, um, we, we talk about the scrappiness and all that all the time in Silicon Valley, but, there, there's also like some polite unwritten rules that once somebody, you know, starts to gobble up a space, there's not a whole lot of competition that feeds into it because a lot of these guys have worked with each other forever. In China, it's dog eat dog. And, and so you see them aggressively going after each other's market. And, it, and again, <clears throat> from a consumer standpoint, I don't know about you, I would rather just have it all in one app because I get frustrated and maybe I'm turning into an old man, right? I get frustrated every time I have to download a new app. And so, um, you know, I think it's one of the reasons Amazon has been so successful is I can do a lot of things at once through Amazon where, you know, remember they used to be a bookstore, right? I mean, that's, that was, that was the only reason you, you went to Amazon and now suddenly it's the very first place I go for no matter what I need because I know they'll likely have it on Amazon. And so I, I think 
there are instances of us doing it in the US, but you don't see it as much. But yeah, privacy, privacy is a tricky thing here, but I, I would argue, uh, if you haven't seen the Netflix special, Social Dilemma, I encourage you to go see it or to watch it. I, I think we lost our privacy um, a long time ago. We just don't realize it happened to us. Yeah, that's actually uh, a great uh, video that Netflix has. So um, I've got another question here uh, from Vincant. Um, how could we make the business see the need for technology, particularly in the areas where they do not see direct benefits, like say moving to the cloud for better supportability or say back-end data infrastructure? Yeah, so I, I think what you have to do is put it in dollars and cents terms. So here's, here's the example that I will give you. Um, we, when I arrived in, in Vegas, it, it was very surprising to me that all the casinos were interconnected. And I'm like, well, wait a second though. Like if, if you had a, a <clears throat> you know, virus go wild in one casino, like you could shut down, you know, one twenty ninth of your revenue stream, but if all the casinos are interconnected, it'll go from one to the other to the other, and you're going to lose a hundred percent of your revenue stream. So here's how we need to go and segment the the casinos, and then if you want to even segment it even better, like why don't we have a point of sale network? Why don't we have a guest network? Why don't we have an application network, right? And so if something goes loose in the casino, maybe I'm only cutting off the cash registers or maybe I'm only, and so just broke it down on, here's how much revenue would go offline if you did that. And, and that was a negative example of here, here's how revenue would be lost. But there's also like, especially with site reliability and, and, and all that, like, hey, we could make innovations faster. What does that mean? Hey, we could, you know, you, you have to get it out of the technical terms and really understand where the money is made in your organization and switch it to those terms. In, in that way, the business feels like you're selling them a business solution instead of just a technology solution. Wonderful. Okay, we have another question here from Raymond King. Uh, as Congress is beginning to make noises about breaking up big tech, is this just political theater or do you think there's real harm to the market and the customer? I, I think it is political theater and I think there is harm to the customer. I mean, we, we saw it with, you know, we, we broke up all the bells, right? And all that happened is they just reassembled in a different way later, right? It didn't add to better customer service. It didn't add to lower fees. If, if there is a, and you know, you can have an argument about how great some of the big techs treat their people or not. Um, but I think there's certainly a case of, um, boy, I know where, where I used to live in Coppell, uh, about four big Amazon warehouses showed up and a lot of people got jobs, right? And, and boy, especially now in the age of COVID, um, you know, I, I look right out my patio door here in my office and I see people in little blue shirts running around all the time delivering packages, right? I, I, you know, I think this is a demand of the American public and, and <clears throat> you know, maybe just my point of view, but I, I think people making more money or a good thing because it's how society evolves, right? I, I think trying to protect some of the old businesses that are, are going to go by the wayside anyway, uh, you know, I, I, again, I think COVID was a great wake up call of like some of these things won't survive. And oh, by the way, the mom and pops that people wanted to survive, a lot of those guys adapted and they did survive. And so, yeah, there it's, I, I hate how politically charged we are in the U.S. right now. I wish we just have more reasonable conversations with each other in, a, in assume good intent, uh, which somehow we seem to have lost that in Washington. Well, I think that about wraps up the questions that we have here. Uh, here, Scott, thank you so very much for joining us today. Um,
fantastic presentation. Uh, for everyone else, we will be available, uh, the presentation will be available on demand uh, throughout. Um, if you have any questions uh, for Scott, obviously his, um, his Twitter handle is there. He recommended that you direct message him through Twitter. Um, we would love to um, have you back, Scott, and uh, hear more from him. So uh, thank you once again for joining us today, and um, we appreciate you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Yep, have a great one. Bye-bye.